Thanks everyone for coming. And it uh, looks like we're the last session in this room and we're gonna make it pretty exciting. So my name is Andrea Minnelli and I'm a senior advisor at Titan Partners and we're an education strategy and investment banking firm. Um, before we get started with this amazing panel, I just wanna do a little show of hands so we know who we're talking to. Educators, okay, great. Investors, all right. Policy people? Okay, shout out who the rest of you are. What are you? <laughs> Interested? Okay, thank you. All right, good. Um, very helpful. Um, so we're here today to talk about a really important and timely topic. Social, emotional learning and the impact of COVID-19 and the fight for racial justice. Given the past 18 months and these twin pandemics, um, this topic has risen to the forefront of educators' minds. And with schools starting next week and educators returning to the classroom, they're really grappling with some very thorny issues about how to deal with this topic in the classroom. I'm gonna use the word, the phrase SEL for social emotional learning. And if we wanna dive into it some more, we have, we have the experts to do it. My firm, Titan Partners, recently completed the second iteration of a study of the state of social emotional learning by surveying district and school leaders and also providers, people that provide professional development, curriculum, and other measurement tools to tackle the issue of social emotional learning in K-12. We, we first did this study before COVID in November of 2019 um, with, the, with the sponsorship of the Gates Foundation in Castle and we have just completed the second iteration of it. So we actually have a very interesting pre and post COVID look at some of the impacts of social emotional learning and what educators are thinking. We're able to survey over 2000 district leaders, that's principals, psychologists, superintendents, as well as over 100 suppliers, which was new as we were trying to identify who is it that is working hard with schools and districts to solve some of these issues. Some of the findings we think were pretty interesting, so I'm gonna go through them really quickly to kind of frame the topic, and then we'll jump in and get our panelists to tell you what's really going on in the ground. 70 to 80% of the schools and districts we surveyed believe that COVID-19 has accelerated interest in SEL, and 60 to 70% believe it's accelerated adoption. Today, districts perceive that student mental health and well-being is 43% more important than they did pre-COVID. Social emotional competence is 23% more important. Now I know these are just numbers and it sounds kind of crazy, but those are big numbers from a year-on-year from a -year -year comparison. 95% of districts expect to increase their spending this year and even more the following year. Finally, we established a market size of about 765 million for this market, and that's district spend on social and emotional learning, broadly defined. That's 43% up from 2019. So this is a big topic. This is, this is the news this fall, and now I'm gonna turn to our panel, and their names are, are up on the screen to really get their point of view. So we're gonna start with Melissa, and what I want her to do is kind of frame SEL, and, 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 and how it's evolved, really, it's, it's been a big topic over the past decade, but what has she seen in terms of how it's exploded to the forefront of educators' minds um, over the past 18 months? Thanks, Andrea, and thanks for joining us. Um, so CASEL, which is the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, has been around for 27 years. Sometimes people think SEL is kind of a new thing. It's actually been around for over a quarter of a century. Our mission has been to help make SEL part of education pre-K to 12 for every child in America. Um, in the last 10 years, we've seen significant growth in interest and priority for SEL, primarily driven by just an influx of research that shows the benefits of SEL to lots of 
priorities, whether it's academic achievement, graduation rates, climate. Um, so the more that that research was demonstrating the powerful impact of SEL, the more you saw interest in this piece. Um, so we were already seeing a incredible surge of interest in SEL. Um, I also think that given that we had, even pre-pandemic, a crisis of mental health in this country, more suicides, more depression, um, more trauma than we've ever seen before, that also was sparking um, interest. People were freaking out about technology and social media and cyberbullying. So there was lots of reasons that people were coming to SEL as a priority in school. Um, with COVID, I mean, we didn't really think the interest could spike any faster, um, but the COVID crisis absolutely accelerated even more. And we, our Castle's increase on sort of inquiries or hits on our website was going up like several hundred, if not thousands of percentage in the last 18 months. So we've seen just a dramatic increase in the recognition that the social and emotional well-being of not just our young people, but our teachers and our educators and our district staff is critically important. Um, and you know, now they're also wondering, like, what do we do about it? Um, so we're seeing that districts are really focusing on what does that mean for us? Um, also, as you pointed out, the racial reckoning that this country has faced uh, last year um, brought into sharper focus the importance of addressing educational equity, of creating inclusive environments for all students, which of course requires social and emotional competence of adults and children to achieve. So we have seen an amazing uptick in that, and CASEL has put out guidance in collaboration with 40 other organizations on how to think about the reopening of school with social and emotional learning as a priority. Um, that's available for free on our website. But the real key message there is that um, we have to center relationships. Um, there's tremendous amount of research on the power of relationships as you know the most powerful mitigator against the effects of stress and trauma. Um, and kids, in some cases, are coming off of you know no school for the last year. They're reconnecting with each other. They're reconnecting with the teachers. The teachers themselves are reconnecting. Um, so we're seeing schools and districts prioritizing the mental health and supports for teachers, thank goodness, and for the adults, and also really focusing on how do we support our students who are kind of coming we're all coming back together after a, a universal trauma. Um, so we're, we're happy to see that more of a priority is put on SEL. Um, and now, you know, there's just an incredible demand, which you are seeing in your report. Thanks. That's, that's really, really helpful. Um, and I think what I'd like to do now is move to, to Christina and Diana, who represent different organizations with different approaches to the SEL issue. And so, Diana, why don't we start with you and just, I mean, you, you know, your organization has been tackling this issue as well as mental health for a long time, but what has been the pre and post response that your organization has, has devised to grapple with these problems? Well, first and foremost, being a digital provider really set us up to respond quickly with, um, with the pandemic and to meet our district's needs where they were at the moment in time. Um, as Melissa mentioned, we knew that mental health, way before the pandemic, um, you know, the crisis was at, at a culminating point. You know, suicide is the second leading cause of deaths for teens and adults. So we had begun that work around, you know, we built our social emotional learning um, suite. Uh, we followed the castle um, alignment, of course. We went beyond that before the pandemic. We added an equity strand. Um, and then we started building out mental health. So all those pieces were in place, pre-pandemic. Once the pandemic did, we accelerated everything. So we were working, for example, on a, um, a student activity center so kids can access the curriculum anywhere, anytime. We accelerated that and made sure that um, it was available about a year before we were ready to release it. You know, what can we get out just to give people access? Um, we obviously had to uh, think about how we could best support our partners who we were spending a lot of time in person with training and with you know, providing um, professional le learning communities. And how can we support them, not even beyond social emotional learning, but more about you know, how can you do this virtually? So that we spent a lot of time on that. We responded with a toolkit for 
back to school last year, um, focusing on what are the four, you know, what, what what do the first four weeks look like so that you can address things like grief and loss, and you can address things like um, you know creating safe and healthy schools. So we were very responsive, and we provided um, free access to any school in the country that wanted um, social emotional learning and mental health at that moment in time, because we knew we had to help. It was about helping. How you know how can we respond? We were all trying to figure this out. We, we didn't know how long, I, I thought it'd be over a long time ago and now we're seeing another spike. So, um, you know, I think it just accelerated everything that we were doing and just, you know, trying to be responsive to what the needs were that our customers were asking for. Great, and Christina, turning to you, could you spend a little time on your model, which is, which is um, you know, they're all, they're all interesting, but this, I, I really want you to try to explain to people the bar philosophy and, and how did you modify or change your approach pre and post COVID? Yes, thank you, Andrea. So our model is building assets, reducing risk, and I am the director of strategic initiatives at the bar center. And our model is about systemic disruption. So it's really important for us to recognize that this isn't an individual's responsibility, but it's a system's responsibility to how are we as a community going to address the needs of the whole student. And so it's really for us to be able to come in and identify and work with the school in their contextual situation to say, how are we going to take time, you know, take the time and space to make sure that we're adequately meeting not the needs of the learners who are furthest from opportunity, but all learners, each and every student. So we have a system that allows our teachers to come together to meet during the week and talk about all students. We level our students and we make sure that our thriving students are taken care of as well as our students who need a lot more intervention. And so we are able to bring our, our teachers who are closest to the, to the problem, to the student, they are able to address and look at what are the barriers that are preventing the student from reaching their full potential and they're able to dive into the root cause, but we're always building upon the student's strengths. We can't build upon what we don't know. So as Melissa talked about, that relationship is really important. So we understand the student strengths, we understand their connections to school, we understand their academic progress, and then we devise an intervention, a goal for the students so that we're helping them be successful. And I think as a former administrator in my former job as a chief academic officer and assistant soup, one thing was really important was the accountability. Where does that lie? If we're going to implement interventions with students, we have to make sure they're successful so we have a mechanism for continuous improvement to come by, back and say did that intervention work or did it not work and if it didn't work then what are we going to do differently to help the student but keep in mind this is all at the teacher level it isn't a top down it isn't coming from the administration the teachers are seated collectively at the table problem solving about the students they serve we also find it very important to cohort our students into a light groups so that the teachers, the core teachers are able to address the students' needs. In addition to that, we um, have an SEL curriculum that um, the students um, take part in each week. But what we find really important is that our teachers facilitate those lessons and they're delivered through our core teachers. So they rotate a lesson each week. But what we understand, you know, our, our model is based on two pillars, data and relationships. And the data is important. So we're not just looking at the quantitative data, the usual stuff we look at, you know, test scores, um, reading proficiency, math proficiency, but we come back and look at the qualitative data we can bring, bring back from the teacher and the student equally participating in an SEL, SEL lesson. And that information we bring back is very salient to how we're able to see the whole child and make sure, we're seeing a, not just a student, but a human being. And so how are we able to um, tap into what we know about the kid and help the student be successful? We have, um, a curated document, a document that curates those conversations so that we can come back and refer to those documents and then continue to provide support for all of our students. On top of that, we also, for a student that the teachers can address their need, we have what is called a risk review. So it's made up of specialized people within our school system that can now tap into community resources or other resources not at the teacher's disposal to help those student overcome, students overcome those obstacles as well. 
But I think the biggest thing, Andrea, in our, our, our system is that we provide coaches that um, work with the school and they provide a weekly support. So this isn't like a one and done. This isn't, okay, you've been trained in eight hours and now you know everything you need to know about SCL. We know that anything at scale needs to be sustainable and it needs to have support. So we're looking at it over a three-year period that we work with schools and we also offer on-site coaching visits. So we're, we're a partner as this uh, as the school is going through this process. So Christina, was there a big stop, you know, during COVID? Because you're a very hands-on in person and look, they're all relationship based, but Diana had a digital curriculum kind of teed up. Ha, is this like, did we take one step backward before we take two steps forward now uh, in your districts? Like hearing about Diana, we really pivoted very quickly. Um, Zoom became our best friend and we were able still to tap into the classroom and work with our um, coordinators. We have a coordinator at each campus and our, we have bar coaches that are um, very experienced educators who reached out to the um, coordinators weekly. So none of those services were suspended. We also quickly pivoted to um, offer virtual adaptions to our SEL curriculum. And so that was very helpful because the teachers could still do this regardless if they were seeing the kid face to face or if they were in a virtual platform. And we were also able to offer professional learning communities. So we bring all of our coordinators together and we're across the US. So we had coordinators that are in rural West Virginia to urban to suburban areas, and they were able to learn from each other. So think about this collective intelligence coming together, talking to others about what's working and not working, and we're still seeing shifts in academic improvement, behavioral, um, behavioral improvement, SEL. I mean, we're still developing agency despite the fact that we weren't in person and we did um, virtual site visits. So we were still able to continue, as Melissa said, build relationships. You know, one of the things that um, in this study that we struggle with, and, and I'm glad we have someone from Castle here, is what defines, you know, quality, you know, an SEL. Um, but Melissa, I am going to pitch it to you, and I don't, you don't really, you can talk about quality writ large, but w w SEL, many times, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, at social emotional learning is implemented in schools for many different reasons. But talk to us about some of those tensions that, educators grapple with um, and that you as experts in the field and providers grapple with just in terms of even the basic understanding of what is SEL and how have those tensions even been exacerbated because with COVID? Yeah, so um, lots of thoughts going through my head. I'm going to try to also respond to some of the things I heard, but um, I, I want to just, um, just underscore something um, that my colleague said about the assets-based approach to SEL and really making sure that this is not perceived as a system for fixing broken kids or kids who have been, you know, through a trauma. While, of course, that's helpful for them, we really want to take a assets-based approach. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, CASEL defines a systemic approach to SEL um, in, we actually have 10 indicators of school-wide SEL. Sometimes people think of SEL is a curriculum that we do every Friday for 30 minutes, or sometimes people think of it as um, a climate strategy or PBIS, or they think about, um, you know, oh, well, we're doing morning meetings, so check that box, or yoga. Um, but a systemic approach to SEL actually takes um, a much deeper look at how our children, how are our young people's social and emotional competence being promoted throughout the day and in the ways in which they're experiencing each other and schools and even the adults around them. Um, so again, on castle.org, you can see the 10 indicators of school-wide SEL. The first one is to really make sure that there is time for explicit skill instruction, because we know that's really important, but it's by no means sufficient, right? That's one. The second is embedded into academics. So are you actually providing opportunities to collaborate with others and develop relationships while while actually doing math or social studies or so forth. Um, the third has to do with that climate that they're experiencing in their classroom and in the school. Um, the fourth has to do with do kids actually have a voice? Can they demonstrate opportunities to really participate in decisions that affect them and affect the school? Um, the fifth has to do with adults social and emotional competence, are we attending to that? Uh, the sixth has to do with um, 
a, a continuum of supports. So is SEL part of your MTSS framework? Um, you also mentioned data for continuous improvement is a key one. I think that's number seven. I know I'm going to forget one. Oh, the next one is, um, is it embedded into the way in which you approach discipline? That's another key piece. And then the last two are about, are you really authentically partnering with families so that you are actually having them at the table for these conversations and getting to know them? And lastly, how are you in integrating with community partners? Um, so there's a lot of different pieces to a systemic approach. And I think the biggest problem that we're seeing right now in the field is that people don't know what SEL is. And, and actually, very recently, there's a lot of misinformation about what SEL is or why people implement it, um, and, which is really tragic because you know we have decades of research showing the benefits of social and emotional learning. It has enjoyed bipartisan support for a long time. Um, so we're really discouraged to see misinformation and weaponization um, happening right now. Um, but So the, the, the biggest thing we need to do is help schools um, stay true to their mission, stay true to their priorities priorities for SEL, especially the role that it can play in their equity mission, uh, and make sure that with respect to how they're communicating about it, that they are tying it to the priorities of the school and that they're holding fast to those priorities, whatever they are. Uh, so we encourage schools and districts to, with their local communities, decide what is important to them and then recommend that they really look at how SEL can support that particular goal. So. In some communities, they may be really thinking about SEL as a strategy for improving workforce readiness. In others, it may be a strategy for mental health. In others, it may be a strategy for academic achievement. Um, we're seeing a growing increase in interest in the role that SEL plays in creating equitable outcomes for kids. Whatever their local priority is, social and emotional learning um, has an important role to play. So really making sure that their communication is tied specifically to the priorities of the local community and um, measuring that. So if you are saying that you want to implement SEL for, you know, you want to improve the, improve the climate or improve attendance or improve academics, whatever it is that you are saying, we really encourage schools to establish those priorities, set a vision, decide how that will be measured, and then engaging in um, robust continuous improvement, both long and short-term cycles. And we asked that they look at implementation data, so did we do what we said we were going to do and did that go well, and outcome data, did we get the benefit that we were looking for? And, and it's, a, it's such an important part. I, there's nothing that makes me crazier than when people implement it and they have no idea if it moved the needle because they, they really just weren't paying attention to the data, so it's a, it's a key piece. Thanks. Diana, you, you know, anything you want to riff on that Melissa said because you're deeply into this, but I would like you to just in your riff, talk a little bit about that intersection of mental health and SEL. I think oftentimes there's a little bit of confusion <laughs> around those two issues, and maybe you could tease that out for us. Sure. So I think two things. Um, to build up what Melissa was saying, uh, and we, um, in this social emotional learning mental health space, we're, we're fairly new. We started out as a company serving kids with autism about 13 years ago. We um, have a very different philosophy and approach to scaling and, um, and, and to how to reach the child where they're at because of that background. We have a staff of board certified behavior analysts. I mean, it just was a great foundation to think differently. And we first started building, we were trying to figure out why hasn't this scaled? Because yeah, it's been around forever. Why hasn't, and it was all these you know, site-based implementations. And I think through the research that we did before we even built our program, the answer kept coming back to the adults. Right, so you know there wasn't supports for the adults out there, and they didn't know where to start. Um, and so that's how we, you know, really start to think about when we started to build our solution. How do we meet adults where they're at, so that then, then they can um, access the curriculum and supports uh, needed to help support the students around them? And how do we meet parents at home too, so that there's that continuum of the messaging going across um, everywhere. And well, the shift that we saw with the pandemic, though, was that now all these conversations we were having you know, um, with districts who were hesitant to really roll out social emotional learning district-wide um, because they wanted school choice, because they didn't want to really think about, you know, oh, well, we're going to give teachers another thing to do, or whatever their excuses were for not implementing in the past went out the door. And they realized that if we are not addressing kids' social emotional learning and mental well-being and adults, 
we're not making progress. And no one is ready to come back to school. Adults aren't ready to come back to school. Kids aren't ready to come back to school. And if we're not meeting them and providing them the supports that they need so they can express themselves, that you know, they could come in and they could know that, hey, maybe I'm not having a, bad, you know, a good day today. How to you know, advocate for themselves. They're not gonna be ready to learn. And so for you know, decades, the focus has always been on academic achievement. Oh my, you know, where are my test scores? And I'm teaching to the test and, and all of that. And, we haven't made progress as a country. We haven't made progress because we haven't met kids and adults where they're at at that moment in time. And so um, all of that said, with that research that we, we had done before we even um, started to developing the program, we knew it had to be more. It had to be more than social emotional learning. We knew that social emotional learning and well-being and mental health went hand in hand. So with social emotional learning, you're teaching, you know, you're teaching um, relationships, you're teaching stress management, all of those things. But with mental health, you're getting to anxiety, you're getting to depression, you're getting to suicide prevention, um, you're getting to some uncomfortable topics like human trafficking, what's safe touch for you know, a, a, an elementary student. Um, and you can't have those conversations if you're not first dealing with their emotions and where they're at and building that skill set to continue that conversation. And so it, it was never a question for us of, one or the other. It was how do we blend them together to best support um, students and adults um, you know, to be ready to learn and to, to be ready to become successful adults. And I just want to jump on um, a comment that she made that's so important. One of the things that Castle has learned um, specifically in the last 10 years, uh, we've partnered with 20 large urban districts to both support and learn from their systemic SEL approach district-wide. And the number one thing these districts tell us if they could start all over again that they would do is focus on the adults. They, um, they all initially started with programs directly for kids without recognizing the critical role that adults play and that their own social and emotional competence is a key piece. Um, so we now see districts who begin this work with that knowledge and that priority recognizing that adults need professional learning that helps them reflect on their own social and emotional learning. They need opportunities for strong relationship building with each other and collaboration opportunities. All of that also should help them in their relationships with parents and community partners, which are key. And that they need to actually intentionally model it, not just assume that they're modeling it, but intentionally model how am I going to react in this moment? Am I gonna fly off the handle? How am I gonna interact with my students and facilitate relationships? So the adult piece is just so important and even Castle, I think, overlooked that critically critical piece in the early um, years. There's now a lot of research that shows that when you focus on adults, teachers are less likely to burn out. They're more likely to stay in their job. They have higher job satisfaction. The kids do better. I mean, it, you can imagine the ripple effect that that research, uh, that that adult uh, um, effort uh, will show. So I just, I wanted to just underscore that really important point. And especially during the pandemic, the adults, we've put so much on our teachers um, and we really need to take care of them as well. The one thing that just to, to build on that, when you start in that approach, you just have to be ready for it because there's gonna be a lot of questions and it may open up things even within the adults that they maybe were not ready to address in their own lives. So the, the support system has to be there because when you go in and you go deep, things are gonna come out and they're yes. gonna come to you. Yeah, that's and that's true so, for kids too. 100%, right, right. Yeah. but when it was just, you know, put in the curriculum in one room and it wasn't really a systematic approach where everybody was, you know, um, yeah. participating, it was a little bit more hidden, right? But now, you know, in our approach, we try to build, you know, systems to support across the district and we're training everybody. You know, one of my favorite stories was, um, you know, just a, a, one of our districts was having a lot of issues um, in the lunchroom and so we did a PLC group with the, the lunch aides. And so when you give everybody that common language, mm -hmm. there is much more greater success into really building that culture of support and guidance throughout the district. But that it will also trigger a lot of things in your own adults. So you, may, you have to make sure that you have a system then to support them right. when, um, you know, when these issues may come up. And, and we, we got calls from you know, our superintendents, and they're like, yeah, we have teachers calling up, and you know, they're, they're relieve it, reliving you know, whatever trauma. And it's like, okay, here's how we can support you. And when you partner with somebody, make sure that you're really partnering with somebody who's going to be there to help you have those co hard conversations. We're there alongside you every step of the way. 
Um, and, you know, we know they're going to be uncomfortable. We help with messaging. We help, you know, with providing um, how to build those um, outcome measures. Um, and, and anyone, not just, you know, rethink specifically. Those are things you really need to look forward to because it will trigger things that you, you, need, you couldn't anticipate beforehand. And you just have to be ready to be able to respond quickly and provide the supports that, you know, everybody needs when you take that type of approach. And not just the cafeteria folks, the security officers, the bus drivers, the custodians, the front office staff, all of these folks are part of the social and emotional movement and um, need, you know, whatever is appropriate for their role, need that kind of experience to recognize I have a role in this too. And in fact, in some of our urban schools in particular, um, the people that work in the school often reflect the community that the school is in, which may not be true for the teachers. And so a lot of times you'll see that a student, you know, we all know the power of a caring adult. Sometimes that caring adult is the custodian, right? Or some, and those relationships are critically important. And it is really an all hands on deck um, approach that we encourage um, every adult in the building it, to be a part of that training. Yeah, this is just so important. And at my dinner table, we often talk about COVID silver linings. And one of the silver linings we found in the survey we did was that spending on professional development has gone up dramatically, which is great news. My wish is that we would go to teaching colleges and begin to implement this kind of teaching and learning in, in as we train teachers. But Christina, I want to go to you because I think because you, you, know, you, you have a very hands-on model that relies on all the people in the building to transform. Um, you know, has, have you seen now more willingness to, to uptake that model? And also, I, I want you to comment to the people on, in your estimation, to see success, is this like a six-month process? Is it a two-year? Is this a, are we on a journey that is, is quite a long one to affect change? Yes, so I think, you know, listening to Melissa and Diana speak, I think, um, where does the responsibility lie? And I think that's an important question for everybody in the audience to consider. And so oftentimes we look to individual teachers or individual, you know, the counselor or the mental health specialist. But in our model, it's really contingent upon that the whole system has to respond. And as I mentioned earlier, it's about data, real-time data, real-time relevant data, and relationships. And our key relationships are student to student, student to staff, and staff to staff. And so that can't just be name only. You can't just say, we are invested in SEL. As a former high school principal, I used to say, show me your master curriculum, master schedule, and I'll show you what you value. So if you say staff-to-staff <clears throat> -staff relationships are important, then you're going to build in time within your schedule to allow for those conversations to occur, for people to come together at the table that are sharing commonalities with their students and discuss what they see happen, happening. That qualitative and quantitative data can't be separated. You can't have academics without SEL. They go hand in hand, and they feed into each other. That dynamic is very important, and it's not static. It's continuously involving evolving so you have to really understand and know your students but most importantly with any initiative you need time to help your teachers understand the why and help them grow in that process. And if you forego that, then you really don't value what you say you're valuing because you just said, okay, here's SEL, I'm gonna hand you a book, go forward and, and do your best. And we know that doesn't work. We know teachers need support and they need to be able to grapple with it in a way that makes sense so they can deliver it to the, um, to the students. Melissa said it has to be infused within the school day. And the only way it can be infused in the school day is if the adult in that building who is part of that system is ensuring that it's infused in the school day. <clears throat> we have a mediation analysis that says, when we, when we look at attitudes and behaviors of teachers, if the attitude of the teacher changes, the behavior of the teacher changes. When the behavior of the teacher changes, the attitude of the student changes. When the attitude of the student changes, their behaviors change, and ultimately that leads to academic outcomes, academic behavior on social emotional outcomes. So earlier, my two colleagues, Diana and Melissa, mentioned that it, it has to begin with the adult, and that's what our system is, is really relying upon. How are we making and assuring that not only are we training you and helping you grow in your knowledge, but you can also experience that, and then you have a collective group of others in the building that are working towards the same goals that you are, and what better way to tap into the expertise of our teachers. As a model, we never come in and tell you what curriculum to use. We don't 
tell you what academic programs. We say, adult, what do you know and how can you help the situation? And what better way to empower a teacher? But those connections and that time and space to do that is equally as important as you saying, we're gonna train you, but now how are we gonna ensure that that training becomes a part of you? We stay with the school for three years. You can actually stay, um, you know, stay with us longer, but any change initiative takes good three to five years, right? It's not overnight that anything is going to be done. And I want to make sure people heard that, and I'm not going to talk about time frames anymore. I'm going to talk about continuous improvement models, because mm -hmm. that's what this is. It's, a, it's just a, it's giving people the tools for continuous improvement. So we've, we've got about five minutes left, so we're going we're gonna to put it to you with the real question. Is SEL here to stay? And what preconditions, if you had to name one, would you like to see put in place to ensure that it's here to stay? I'll take that. Go so, for it. Um, it has to be. I, I don't think we have any other options. But what we, what we do know about education is that if it's not mandated and not a requirement, it will not, it will not happen. It will not stay. And people are not going to do it. And it will be, let me check a box. You know, so I think state standards um, we have a lot of states that have already implemented social emotional learning and mental health standards, by the way. Um, once they're embedded in the state requirements, you will see you know, larger adoption and you will also see the, fa you know, the fact that districts are going to have to figure it out and they're going to have to figure out how it works hand in hand with their academics. But until there, you know, there's widespread adoption of standards um, and, and, and mandates, um, it's still going to be this kind of Optional, yeah. Okay, Christina? I think, as I mentioned earlier, the idea that SEL and academics go hand in hand is, is really why I think it will sustain growth over time. I also think that it's really important for, for when legislators dole out money or when systems dole out money, that they say do not adopt a program that is not evidence-based. Because there are, this is the time where lots of people are circling, telling you they have the magic bullet. And the magic bullet is in the iteration. That magic bullet is in the daily grind and that continuous improvement cycle. And, and the research support, our research supports that when you do certain things, these are the outcomes that you're going to have. But I don't, I think we need to be really reticent to the idea that you, you just can't pick something without doing your due diligence to make sure that it's backed by evidence. And I think that's very important. Yeah, and I actually think that's the biggest risk to the field, um, as you guys probably saw even at this conference, that lots of people are hanging up their SEL shingle right now saying, you know, we've got a solution, and, um, and so there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of noise. So I agree with you wholeheartedly that the evidence is, is critically important. Um, and I am actually very optimistic because what we have seen at Castle is that when districts take a thoughtful evidence-based approach to a systemic approach to SEL, um, that it does sustain. In fact, when we launched our partnership with ten distri eight districts originally in 2011, we started with them as a part of a research study because we thought, we'll start with eight because we're going to lose half of them. <laughs> Even though one of our research questions was, is this feasible? We really weren't sure if they were going to last three years. Not only did those eight districts last three years, that study was extended to six years. 10 years later, those original eight districts are still in community with each other, well beyond the life of the research study. And, um, and in fact, they've grown. And part of the reason they've grown is because a superintendent from Austin moved to Atlanta and brought that priority with them. And a superintendent from Anchorage moved to Minneapolis and brought the priority with them. So those original eight districts have turned over their superintendents 30 times since 2011, in the last 10 years. Not one of them has dropped that priority for SEL. They continue to deepen their implementation, and it continues to be sustained, in part because it is in the system, they've done it in a thoughtful way, and they're in community with each other to learn from each other and continuously grow and improve. So I am optimistic that it's here to stay. I think there are other things that we can do to ensure that. And um, you know, while there's some crazy political stuff happening, states have moved, 42 states are um, collaborating with each other on how do we create conditions for SEL. So 
that's a good sign. Um, and what I am hopeful for that hasn't been done is, um, and you mentioned this earlier, is that schools of education will require more social emotional learning expertise to build into um, the teaching force and the principal pipeline. Uh, it's just not okay that they don't have expertise and that the burden is placed entirely on the district to train them. Um, that said, it is an ongoing thing. You don't, it's not like you've mastered SEL. I mean, I, I work on my SEL all the time. I have 13-year-old twins. Um, so I, I'm always working on my self-management. Um, but, but, I, but I think having a, a workforce that is prepared to teach social-emotional learning would be a huge step in the right direction. Really awesome. Um, so happy to have you all speak here. Thank you very much. Um, our report will be published in early September. There's a lot of other good stuff. I, we didn't get to talk about funding. Um, and the role that philanthropy and investors can play in helping, but I agree that standards um, and, uh, and evidence-based and, and promoting high quality um, is super, super important. We'll be outside. We're happy to talk to you outside. Thank you for coming.